Hey, BioPeople. Today we're going to talk about photosynthesis, respiration, how those play a role in the carbon cycle. So, organisms, depending on what type of organism they are, get their food that they need to survive different ways. One of those ways is by making your own food. So, producers, also known as autotrophs, can make their own food using energy from another source, like the sun. You see the sun in the picture. Those ferns are taking that sun, they're taking the water, they're taking the carbon dioxide, and they're going to make their own sugars. And we have some other ones. And you recognize most of these are green, so they're still going to use photosynthesis. We have things like cyanobacteria, and those are using the sun. These are kind of the most primitive photosynthetic organisms. Algae, and then plankton, phytoplankton. Just think of SpongeBob and Mr. Plankton, and he is green as well because he's doing photosynthesis. So others don't make their own food. They consume it, so we have heterotrophs. And consumers eat other organisms like the great white heat and the seal right here. Decomposers are going to absorb their chemical energy. They break down with absorption, and they take in that energy. And those are called heterotrophs. Most producers use photosynthesis. We have carbon dioxide plus water, and they use that light to break down that carbon dioxide and water, and then they're going to turn that into sugar and oxygen. And then the real important organelle that we've talked about, the chloroplast, that's found in those plant cells. That's where the magic of photosynthesis is happening. So again, photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast. Again, these are happening in eukaryotic cells. That cyanobacteria is actually using its plasma membrane. All right here we have a little illustration of a chloroplast and it's used a special pigment called chlorophyll and most of that's found in those little thylakoid membranes right throughout here and again chloroplasts use the sun energy water and carbon dioxide to make sure a sugar called glucose gets made and then as a byproduct something that's not needed but that oxygen that's just made The Pacific Ocean, 250 miles off the coast of the Galapagos Islands. In 1977, a deep sea submarine descended over 8,000 feet. Its mission? To investigate hydrothermal activity on the ocean floor. Marine explorer Robert Boward was aboard. The, uh, he detected a dramatic change in the ocean's temperature. To you know, we were not expecting what we found. We were expecting to find water. And we had a camera inside the vehicle, but it was, it was uh, just taking pictures. So we didn't know what we had until we came back. We brought it up to the surface, and we processed the film, and we, got, we knew the spot where the temperature spike was, and it was like going to Disneyland. Probably one of the biggest biological discoveries ever made on Earth was made that day. Bauer and his team were the first to see it, face to face. Hydrothermal vents. Immense chimney-like structures, several stories high, spewing hot water geysers, black with minerals and nutrients. The temperature around these deep sea vents was a scorching 760 degrees Fahrenheit. And then an astonishing sight. Life, thriving without sunlight. A biological community never seen before. An exotic garden of marine life. A species without eyes. Others resembling Triassic era fossils over 200 million years old. What we totally were blown away by were these giant tube worms. Some of them eight, nine, ten feet tall. And when you cut them, they bled human-like blood. I mean, when the submarine landed, there was a squish, and red blood came up around all the portholes. And that's how, how eerie it was. And then to find these extremely unusual creatures living in this oasis, it had no relationship to the normal life of the deep sea. And yet here they were living in this toxic water. But yet these creatures were thriving on it. And then when we dissected, I remember we took one of these clams, 
when we opened it up in the first place, as soon as we opened it up, it stunk. It's, it's full of hydrogen sulfur. A horrible smell. Rotten eggs. Yeah. And we opened it up, and then we looked, and, and it didn't look like, it, it looked like beef. It was red, bright red. And it didn't have an anatomy of a clam. It was like, what happened to the clam? Someone had taken over its body. And that something was a bacterium, a tiny bacterium that had figured out over eons of time how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark chemically through a process we now call chemosynthesis. And that was the discovery, that there was another life system on Earth that did not go by the book that you and I read, that was not living off the energy of the sun, but was living off the energy of the Earth itself. And that really opens up the ball game. I'll say. And these bacterium, we now think, are the largest mass of living things on Earth. They're, they're, they're in the rocks. In the whole mountain under, range. Under the ocean. If you added up all the people and all the living things on land and add up all the creatures in the ocean and the th few things in the sky, and you got a number of so many tons, there's more tons of biomass. We used to think, you know, the, the, the insects ruled the Earth. Right, yeah. Wrong. These bacterium. So where are these vents? All over the Earth. They were, imagine a baseball with a seam on it. That seam begins beneath the polar ice caps, goes down through the Atlantic, into the Indian Ocean, across the Pacific. It runs around the Earth for 42,000 miles. It's the largest feature on Earth, the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And it's underlain by literally tens of thousands of magma chambers. Is that where life began in well, the hot springs? Well, that's what people are now thinking. The, the biology books that we were reading have now been thrown away. Yeah, and they're right. You know, everything you had to be on the surface. That's right. And you had this soup, and the lightning bolt hit it, and you formed all sorts of amino acids and things like that. But now, what we think is that the the hydrothermal vents may have been the site of life on Earth. It's also given us a new prospecting tool for searching for it elsewhere with our own solar system. We're now looking at a moon of Jupiter called Europa, which we think has an ocean. We think it has underwater volcanoes, and there should be life down there. The question is, how smart are their clams? <laughs> Did hydrothermal vents give birth to the first primitive microbes on Earth? Perhaps. But one thing is certain. Their discovery challenged long-held beliefs about the conditions necessary for creating life. And once life happened, there was no there? stopping it. So again, up, those organisms are called uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. So what kind of organisms use respiration? Think about that for a second. It's a big idea. And again, remember that respiration is turning food into energy. So all organisms need energy from that food, even a plant. They're going to do respiration. So all the domains of life, they're doing some sort of respiration. So here's an example, lactobacillus. It's a anaerobic bacteria. It's important for making yogurt, among other things. So there are two kinds of respiration, anaerobic with no oxygen, anaerobic with oxygen. What we come to find out, aerobic makes a lot more energy with less food, so it's more efficient. So respiration breaks down glucose made from photosynthesis and then produces ATP. And ATP is that nucleic acid that's kind of the currency of energy within the body. ATP is that molecule that's going to do all the work. So all organisms do that cellular respiration, but only some of them are really geared up for it. They only have those mitochondria. And those mitochondria, they need these membranes, just like chloroplasts are make all the membranes for photosynthesis these mitochondria make all the membranes for respiration so what you're going to do go ahead and take a second to copy these two chemical equations down and we're going to trace our carbon and we're going to trace our oxygen through these two processes so grab a orange or pink highlighter something like that and circle all the carbons and you can see where those carbons are and then for our oxygen we're going to do those in blue and trace those throughout so again our target is making sure we can trace how carbon and oxygen move throughout these organisms and the atmosphere all that stuff 
this is that movement. So here's another little picture. I like this picture. It just kind of shows it and shows those two organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondria, and how that's circling around. The oxygen gets used by the mitochondria, and luckily that oxygen gets made by the chloroplast. And then here's kind of a bigger macro view. We have the atmosphere, which has carbon dioxide and water vapor in it, and then tons and tons of nitrogen. And then over here we have the oxygen in the atmosphere. So about 78% is nitrogen and 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen. And then these are really small percentages. So we have the carbon is going into the plants in photosynthesis right here. So the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going into the plants. And then it gets made into sugar. So that carbon is going into this banana slug here. Right? And then that banana slug is using the oxygen from the atmosphere that just so happened to be created by photosynthesis. And it's using that sugar. And it's going to turn that into energy it can use. And it's going to exhale a little water vapor. It's going to exhale a bunch of carbon dioxide. And that's a big cycle. So this is kind of a picture of our carbon and oxygen cycle. So take some time, go back and make some repetitions, write some summaries, draw some more pictures, go back, watch the video one more time, look at your targets, and add those different pieces. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, Del Campo.